Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Stephanie DiPetrillo and I lead the NJTOD.org project at Rutgers uh, Voorhees Transportation Center, which we do with support from New Jersey Transit. Over the past several years, we have partnered with Downtown New Jersey to offer a series of learning opportunities that focus on the intersection between our community's downtowns and transit-friendly planning. And today is no exception. I am excited to hear from our panelists today, truly a stellar group of people who have been working on rethinking how to use our rights of way. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Courtney now. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Courtney Mercer with Downtown New Jersey. We're a nonprofit education advocacy organization all about downtown revitalization. Um, we do a lot of programming throughout the year. We're ex always excited to co-host this along with njtod.org and the Transit Friendly Planning Program at New Jersey Transit. Uh, just a little shameless plug, uh, if you're ever looking for recordings or other resources um, from the programming, programming that we do, you can visit it downtownnj.com to get all that good stuff. Um, we have long advocated for a shift in the use of roadways to be more oriented to people than cars. Um, COVID-19 tactical urbanism proved the case that one, this can work, two, there's demand from consumers, and three, that it's good for business. Um, we're happy to be co-hosting this program today to give you the tips, examples, and empirical evidence to support your own efforts to rethink the right of way. But on a side note, we know there's still a lot of work to do, particularly around regulations in New Jersey. Um, so if your town has been denied or had troubles with state approvals for street closures, I'm asking you to please mail me your story and any support documents to info at downtownnj.com. This is one of the advocacy efforts we're going to take up, so please uh, let us know. Now. And before we get started, the little housekeeping, you should have already gotten a notification that this program is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be posted to DNJ's YouTube channel, as well as both DNJ and NJTOD's websites. We'll also post a PDF version of the PowerPoint uh, on those sites. Uh, we are using Zoom meeting today rather than webinar, so please be sure to keep yourself on mute and your videos off. Uh, feel free to share your stories, ideas, thoughts, agreement, disagreement um, in the chat throughout the session. We'll also be gathering questions from the chat to share with the panelists towards the end of the program. So please don't be shy about using the chat. Um, now on to the program. Today, we are joined by Spencer Gober, Associate Manager um, of the Office of Community and Economic Development at the Delaware Valley Regional Plan Commission, uh, Dave Lesberg, CEO and Managing Principal at Arterial, Jay Muldoon, who's the Director of Special Projects with the Borough of Metuchen, Kelly Zabrowski, Treasurer of the Washington Street Management Company, and Celeste Alcina, who's a Facilities Planner with New Jersey Transit's Transit Friendly Planning Program. Um, you can find their full bios uh, at bit.ly slash forum bios. I'll put that link in the chat as soon as I'm done speaking. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Celeste to begin the program. Thanks, Courtney. Again, my name is Celeste Alcina, and I'm a Facilities Planner in the Transit Friendly Planning Program at NJ Transit. So the Transit Friendly Planning Program provides local technical assistance and helps develop partnerships to better coordinate planning between NJ Transit and New Jersey communities. We have a variety of program resources, including the Transit Friendly Planning Guide, data application, and newsletter. You can visit our website for more information on our program and resources. Today, we're going to hear a panel of experts discuss their experience rethinking the right of way. Next slide. When thinking about the right-of-way, some may think of roads like the one pictured, rail or even electrical easements, but the right-of-way is more than that. The right-of-way allows the movement of people, vehicles, and goods through a piece of land. Next slide. It can include sidewalks, open space, dedicated bus lanes, and other public amenities. And in recent years, communities have rethought the public right-of-way and worked to reduce the amount of space dedicated to cars, and increased space for pedestrians, bicyclists, and other uses. The Transit Friendly Planning Guide provides some examples of how communities can rethink the right-of-way. The guide discusses best practices for pop-up spaces and temporary uses, such as parklets. Next slide. Pedestrian access can be prioritized through the addition of curb extensions, pedestrian crossing islands, and leading pedestrian intervals. Next slide. Transit waiting areas are also found in the right-of-way. Meaning waiting areas should be 
safe and comfortable natural materials and creative designs can also be used like in this photo. Next slide. Stormwater management can be maximized in the right of way through green infrastructure techniques like green street planters. And for more ideas on how to re-envision the right of way, we encourage you to check out the transit friendly planning guide. And now I'd like to pass it over to our panelists. They will each give a brief presentation on their work, rethinking the right of way. And then we'll dive into a panel discussion guided by questions. To start us off, we have Dave Lustberg, CEO and Managing Principal at Arteria. Uh, thank you, Celeste. I think that um, whoever the host is has to turn my camera on. There we go. All right, great. Thank you very much, Celeste. That was that was excellent and very interesting. And thank you, everyone, for uh, for attending today. Uh, this is an exciting topic for us, and uh, I'm excited to discuss it with you, and then and also uh, uh, speak with the other panelists. So uh, with that, I'll just get started here. So uh, my name is Dave Lustberg. Uh, I'm, I uh, own a firm called Arterial. We're located in Montclair, New Jersey. New Jersey. We are an urban design and landscape architecture firm, and we specialize in the design of streets. So that, that is really what our focus is. So you can go ahead. So one thing I want to emphasize is that there are three important steps when designing and implementing streets. First is the planning step, right? So this is the capital plan. Second, is the design, right? This is the fun part. This is when we get to put pen to paper and come up with all the ideas. And third is implementation. And that is the construction phase. And none of these three phases can be overlooked as far as their importance in the process. Next. So why are streets so important? So the right of way itself in any given city or town occupies about 30% of the land or public space that that town owns. So those streets, in our opinion, should do much more than just move vehicles. Next. So when we're designing streets, we think of two key factors. Those factors are first, the priorities. What, are, what uses and users are we prioritizing on that street? And second is the performance. And the performance is the detailed measures that we take within that framework that we've established when thinking of priorities. So first we'll talk about priorities. So this scale that you see here, we believe that all streets fall somewhere on this scale when we're prioritizing those streets. And it's not that any street in particular is better than the other or that any use is better than the other. It's that we wanna be making intentional decisions on how we're prioritizing those uses. So I'll give you some examples here. So go ahead. So first we could look at a street that's a that we would call a car first street. Now that might be a highway, that might be say the Garden State Parkway, et cetera. Now it's not that that is wrong or right. It's that we wanna make the intentional decision that that is a car first street. Now, if we wanted to push that further to the left, we can make that street more mobility first. Now, this is all within the same width. We narrow the median, we move some of that space to the side, and we provide that for other transportation modes. We can then push that arrow further to the left. Next slide. And this is really getting closer to like where a main street would fall, right? So now we've taken some of that angled parking and we've given more of that space to the public, to the sidewalk, to those other uses. And then finally, we can take that, if we wanna eliminate all of that angled parking, we push it furthest to the left. And now we end up with a scaled street that's more like a main street. And we end up with a whole additional amount of space that we can use for whatever use we would like to prioritize. So within that right of way, there's a lot of flexibility. So next we look at the performance. So when we're thinking of performance, we think of five categories, and this relates to all elements that we select and place within that right of way. So first we think of functionality. Does it serve the purpose it's supposed to serve? Next is arts and culture. Does that material, furniture, et cetera, represent the place that it's within, right? We don't want cookie cutter designs. We wanna celebrate that place. Third is health and the environment. Is it sustainable? Is it resilient? Fourth is economic vitality. Are we designing to support the businesses that are adjacent to, the, to that street? 
And finally is design quality. And when we talk about design quality, we're not talking about the subjective part of design, whether we like it or not. We're talking about the quality and durability of that design, right? We want to design streets that last a long, long time, not you know these sort of stage sets that are going to deteriorate over three to five years. Okay, so let's move ahead. Now I'm going to show a few examples. And when I walk through these examples, you'll notice that these are going sort of from the right side on that scale to the left side on that scale. So the first one uh, is a project that we were uh, that we're just in the process of wrapping up the concept phase. This is Main Avenue in Passaic. So Main Avenue is a very wide corridor dominated by car traffic, right? So there's parking down the center, two travel lanes in either direction, parking along the curb line, and fairly narrow space for pedestrians. So first thing we wanted to do, go ahead, Courtney, uh, is we wanted to make sure that we understood the priorities. So we worked with students at local high schools, next. We worked with the community to understand those priorities through a series of open houses, next. And we developed this game that really forced people to think about priorities. So this is like a street mix game where we had people assemble their own right of way as if they could set it up how they would love to see it. And so people were able to really demonstrate what their priorities are to us in a graphic way. And this was very eye-opening. Next. So what the result was, the, the, this is a view of what the original street cross section is, right? So we're very far to the right where that red arrow is in the traffic flow. So now we push it a little to the left and we take that parking, we turn it into a promenade and we maintain two lanes of traffic in either direction. We use additional space to pick up some bike lanes. If we push it further to the left, we uh, eliminate a lane of traffic and widen the sidewalks. And then if we go even further to the left, we just replace that entire center parking area with a public park, a linear public park, eliminate the lane of traffic and have bike lanes. And this is actually the solution that the city ultimately uh, went with. So let's jump to the next one. So now this is a little smaller scale. So this is now downtown Milburn. So this is Main Avenue in Milburn, New Jersey. So this is a view of Main Avenue uh, today. And now I'll just walk you through where we sort of were with this. So this was Main Avenue before. So it was three travel lanes in either direction. It was really further into that traffic flow uh, category on the scale, fairly narrow sidewalks. So we were able to take that arrow and push it to the left and widen that sidewalk by eliminating one of the turning lanes that was found to be uh, unnecessary. Next. So here's a view before again, and now we click and after. So now you can see a view of the street, string lighting overhead, wider sidewalks, really funneling people to the corners, and they're able to close this street um, on weekends or day to day to allow businesses to really occupy this street and create an outdoor dining space, as you saw in that original photo. And then there's the performance. So now we look at some of the details. So we wanted to tell the story of Milburn, right? So you can see to the right are infiltration planters. Now these planters are, they function as infiltration planters. They also represent the history of Milburn because of it's, it was a mill town founded on rivers. The benches themselves are a material that's very durable and reflects the history of mining uh, in the area, uh, quarrying, I'm sorry. And the benches are oriented so that they're facing the businesses to promote window shopping and economic vitality. So those benches, while they're used for seating, they're, they're really serving a number of purposes uh, within the space. So that's high performance uh, furniture. Go ahead, next. And then finally, we'll end with furthest left on the scale. So this is when we take a street and we really transform it into a public space. And I'm gonna show two examples here. The first is South Park Street in Montclair. So uh, we could flip to the next one. Uh, South Park Street before was really a car dominated street, very wide travel lanes, uh, angled parking on both sides, narrow sidewalks. The town really wanted to transform that into a public plaza, a really public space. So we took that arrow, pushed it far to the left, straightened out that angle parking, narrowed the travel lanes, widened the sidewalks and really created a promenade on either side of the street. Go ahead.
Here's another view before, and then we'll go to after. So you can see one of the features to point out here is the flush median down the center. Now what that does is it's traffic calming, but it also allows them to open up the street for events without having the, this obstruction in the center of a mounted curb. So that's a nice flush feature down the center. Next. And here's another view of before. You can see very little sort of space for pedestrians, for window shopping, et cetera, and after. And when you look at this, so some of the high performance things to point out here, again, the seeding, right? So those planters, they function for seeding. They help with the uh, environment, providing shade, providing infiltration. And they also help with economic vitality. They frame that corner so people will sit and hang out. And the longer the time they spend downtown, the more money they tend to spend. Next. And we'll end with uh, Seymour Street in Montclair. So this one is further furthest to the left. So we've taken this street, the town set their priority that they wanted this to be fully pedestrian. So um, this was Seymour Street uh, before. You can see it's a normal neighborhood uh, street with the Wellmont Theater. You can see the billboard there is the Wellmont Theater with so people used to line up for the Wellmont Theater and spill out into this street. So they wanted to transform this into an arts plaza. So this is the after. So you can see we've closed the street entirely, transformed it into a 100% pedestrian space. You can go to the next. So here's again before, and then we could look at the after. So now you can see where people, this is people queuing for an event at the Wellmont Theater. There's plenty of space for them, bicycle parking, some branding. Uh, we're able to get really all the features in there that create an exciting public space. Next. This is another before, further up the street, closer to the Wellmont Theater. And we'll see the after. Uh, plenty of seating and public space for people to gather and, and hang out uh, day to day and during a show. And, one high performance feature I'll point out here is you can see the stair in the distance, that wooden uh, step seating area. So that area was designed for step seating day to day, but then also functions as a stage when they have events for the Wellmont Theater. So if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, this is a view from the back of the plaza before. And then if we look at the after, this is from just behind that stage. So you can see the public art in the foreground, the stage just in front of us and people using this day to day. But when they have events, that transforms into a stage and they can have you know, several hundred people here gathering for music uh, or other events. Um, I have to give a shameless plug on this for, for, for Courtney. This was one of the uh, Downtown New Jersey Awards this year. So uh, we're very happy about that. Um, so thank you. And now I will pass it over to Spencer Gober. Dave, uh, you highlighted some uh, really fantastic examples of how the built environment can be improved to provide for a diverse multimodal approach to planning for the right of way, but you also teed me up fantastically for my presentation. Good morning again, everyone. I'm Spencer Gober, Associate Manager of the Office of Community and Economic Development at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. And I want to spend a few minutes today talking about how uh, we use location analytics to quantify the pandemic's impact on some of our region's downtowns and main streets. And I have a lot of information that I want to move through quickly today, but I've tried to format the slides so that they can stand by themselves if anyone wants to go back and look at them after the presentation today. So with that, let's get started. Uh, next slide, please. Before I dive into the work, let me provide a little bit of background on who DBRPC is. We are the federally man uh, mandated metropolitan planning organization for the nine county region that makes up Greater Philadelphia. Uh, which is, encompasses counties on both the New Jersey and Pennsylvania sides of the Delaware River. We conduct short, medium, and long-term plans and fund a variety of projects covering topics such as transportation, land use, and economic development, just to name a few. Next slide. In 2020, we were already in the process of updating a, a 2013 inventory of 75 uh, of, the re, uh, of the region's uh, retail districts uh, across Greater Philadelphia before the pandemic even hit. Uh, when, it, when the pandemic started, we worked quickly to finalize this inventory um, with the expectation that there would be Im impacts on the region's downtown. So we wanted to gather a snapshot before, uh, before that happened. The inventory included everything from the mix of uses, the types of retail that were located in the downtowns, 
as well as walk scores and uh, uh, demographic data. We used this inventory to then develop nine different downtown topologies, which included uh, transit-oriented downtowns. After we did the inventory, we then came up with uh, a diversity score for all 75 of the downtowns. The lower the score, the more diverse the downtown. Next slide. In the fall of 2020, DVRPC purchased geolocated de-identified cell phone data from the Buxton Company, which allowed us to conduct limitless analyses on visits to and the trade areas of the region's downtowns. We used this data to measure the impact of the pandemic related to economic shutdown in the spring of 2020, as well as the, the degree to which the downtowns recovered during the reopening period later that year. We benchmarked these time periods against pre-pandemic data. We then used this analysis to calculate a pandemic impact score for all 75 of the downtowns that we uh, included in the retail inventory. Next slide. We then compared the diversity scores from the retail inventory with the pandemic impact scores. And what we found was that the uh, greater diversity generally equated to a lower pandemic impact. So in other words, more diverse downtowns, whether it was uh, economic, environmental, or social diversity, were also more resilient to the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, in the fall of 2021, we conducted a more nuanced analysis with updated 2021 cell phone data and walked away with uh, nine key findings that were a little bit more nuanced than just the, the diversity score that we had uh, previously. First, we um, discovered that no matter what time period we analyzed, the number one variable leading to increased resiliency in a downtown was greater economic, environmental, and social diversity. Next slide. Second, larger downtowns with more robust residential and employment populations were less impacted by the pandemic than the region's smaller downtowns. Next slide. One of the findings most relevant to today's forum was that the pandemic's impact was lower in the region's more walkable downtowns, which was determined based on walk scores and the number of vehicles per household. Next slide. Despite the economic uh, shutdown's impact on eating out, uh, as the share of food and beverage uses, which included craft breweries, distilleries, and wineries, increased in the downtown, the pandemic impact score actually decreased. Next slide. Similarly, and despite everyone's fear that the pandemic would lead to a retail apocalypse, the region's more resilient downtowns had a higher share of retail uses compared to those downtowns that were more greatly impacted. Next slide. And surprisingly, e-commerce and brick and mortar appeared to enjoy a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, and this is consistent with studies that were done before the pandemic. And the, the relationship between brick and mortar and e-commerce was actually termed the halo effect. And what we found was that during periods of high case counts and economic shutdown, downtowns where businesses had a greater digital presence uh, actually were more impacted during those periods. But during reopening, when people were able to visit the downtowns again, um, those that had greater digital presence actually recovered uh, more significantly than those that did not. Next slide. Increased demographic diversity was also related to a decreased pandemic impact score during the economic shutdown. Next slide. And interestingly, of all the variables we analyzed, being transit oriented was the only variable that had no uh, relationship to the overall impact in the region's downtowns one way or the other. It was interesting that during the economic shutdown and periods of high case count, being transit oriented actually um, helped the downtown be more resilient. But during um, the reopening period and during periods of lower case count, there wasn't as much of a recovery in transit oriented downtowns. And then the next slide. Lastly, we found that uh, the vacancy rate, uh, as it went up in a downtown, so did the pandemic impact score. And then finally, the last slide, I will wrap things up with uh, my contact information. And let uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out afterwards. And what we'll be happy to discuss as well today during the panel. Um, and if you want to take a deeper dive into the, uh, the body of work, you can visit www.dvrpc.org forward slash community revitalization. So with that, I will hand things over to Jay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Spencer. Um, I'm Jay Muldoon. I'm the Director of Special Projects in the Borough of Batuchin. I'm happy to be uh, with you all today and part of this panel. 
Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Metuchen, um, we're located in uh, northern Middlesex County. We're a small town, less than three square miles, about 15,000 people uh, population. Um, we have a traditional, um, pretty vibrant Main Street in our downtown. We're one of the New Jersey um, transit villages. We have a uh, New Jersey Transit Station on the north, Northeast Corridor. And uh, in the past, say, dozen years or so, there's been a significant amount of uh, downtown uh, redevelopment taking place, a lot of mixed use in our downtown. And, um, you know, we, we're now, we have kind of a vibrant restaurant scene, or over 35 uh, restaurants and food establishments. So today I'm going to share with you some information about um, how Metuchen, the steps we've taken um, to uh, utilize the the right of way. Next slide, please. So this kind of, the story kind of starts um, as most of a lot of our stories do um, in the in the pandemic. Um, so in in 2020, as the as COVID was really hitting our downtown businesses hard, um, the borough we proactively collaborated with our special improvement district, the Metuchen Downtown Alliance, and we quickly created a um, an outdoor dining and retail program because um, we, want, we, wanted, we wanted our businesses to be able to utilize public spaces and the right of way uh, back when everything was shut down. Um, so we looked, uh, so this map shows what we, what we created. So we looked at existing alleyways and businesses that had, uh, that maybe had patios. Um, we identified um, where sidewalk dining um, could, could take place. Uh, we looked at some of our, our, our parking lots because there were no commuters parking anymore. So we um, you know, identified where um, outdoor dining and, and retail could take place. So that, that's uh, uh, what this um, shows. Uh, next slide. So we were, a, because we did planning before, um, as soon as the governor and, and the uh, ABC's orders came out, uh, to when they were issued, we were able to pivot immediately. And I think that following weekend, um, we um, started our outdoor dining. So this shows in June of 2020, uh, our first step, our first initial um, uh, use of uh, a, a street is we closed a new street on weekend. So from every Friday afternoon to Sunday evening, um, new street was closed. And the restaurants, we had about five restaurants um, uh, on New Street, and they, you know, they set up in the um, in the in the street, uh, and then we had uh, live music on um, on Saturday evenings, and um, in addition to this, um, you know, uh, an Irish pub on Main Street utilized uh, a. a commuter parking lot that was that was vacated and as well as all of the other uh, restaurants and businesses that had that fronted on main street or new street or in the downtown were able to utilize uh, that public space for the, for their business next slide so as things evolved um, we shifted to a um, seven day a week one lane closure on on new street um, because in the prior scenario we kind of had just the street closed on weekends so in um, september of 2020 we closed one side of new street seven days a week um, to better support our our restaurants um, so that they on a daily basis they could be utilizing uh, this space for um, you know for lunch as well as dinners and um, and we also kept one lane of traffic uh, open on this street um, so that, because uh, one of our challenges is um, our downtown doesn't really have a, a nice straight grid system. Um, so this new street is one of the few kind of north south um, uh, arteries in town. So uh, it, when, we, it would, when it's closed, if it's going to be closed permanently every day, it would create um, traffic problems and other problems that I can talk about later. Next slide. And then the evolution here continues. So um, with our special improvement district, the Metuchen Downtown Alliance, um, through a grant they received, they purchased, um, I think there were four or five um, heated uh, tents that we, because in, in the prior scenario, each restaurant had to put up 
uh, their own provide their own tents and and everything was cut sort of on their own. But so in working with the downtown alliance, they purchased and installed these tents, which were um, enclosed, and those were installed um, in December of 2020, and they stayed up until October of 2021 when. Uh, the road was reopened to two-way traffic uh, once restaurants were able to um, resume full occupancy. Um, so then the, the, the tents came down um, at that time, but it was a great uh, improvement having enclosed. This picture shows on one side of it, you know, being open because it was, uh, I guess it was in April of 2021 when the weather was warmer, but uh, restaurants were able to function and, and use um, the space in these tents uh, you know, dirt during the winter, which um, was a great, a great help to them. So besides New Street, so today this, this shows, um, you know, all of our restaurants downtown are utilizing the sidewalk right of way um, outside their, their, their businesses. Um, so as everyone knows, outdoor dining has, you know, has changed, uh, the world has changed and outdoor dining is now really part of, uh, of any restaurants, I think, business plan. So two of our restaurants, the Greek on Main and Manja Toscano, um, they've sort of went from initially, even pre-pandemic, just having a couple tables outside um, to, um, uh, in the case of Manja Toscano, in the rear of that, to the right of that building, they they built a, a kind of a roof structure initially um, for outdoor dining. And this year, they have enclosed that um, and so has the Greek on Main on their sidewalk dining this this uh, enclosure uh, just went up uh, maybe two months ago and as you can see it, it it's it does it, it it doesn't expand the area that they they've always been had always had tables on on the sidewalk but being able to enclose this um, you know obviously working with the borough um, we kind of did this as a uh, as a trial. Let's let's see, you know, uh, how it could work out, and and it's worked out really well. And um, so I I think this shows um, how outdoor dining and use of of the right of way is something that you know businesses really want to take take advantage of. Um, and um, when you said one of the things that we one of the challenges that we had in talking to restaurants um, about this is we have to maintain um, a clear passageway uh, for pedestrians and people with with mobility issues. So um, one of the challenges that all towns might have is how wide or narrow is your is your sidewalk. Um, there are places in our town where this couldn't uh, this couldn't be be done because you aren't able to maintain that clear passageway. So I think that covers what I um, wanted to share with you this morning. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Callie Zabrowski from beautiful Cape May. Hi everyone, my name is Callie Zabrowski. I am the treasurer of the Washington Street Mall Management Company. Um, we are the private company that manages the three block Washington Street Mall in Cape May. Next. Um, so the Washington Street Mall was created in 1971. Um, this area of Cape May was always a central business district, but it was very car focused. And, um, you know, you popped in, did what you were doing and you left. There was not a lot of space for pedestrians. The sidewalks were narrow. Um, so in 1971, Cape May began a revitalization and this street was permanently closed to automobile traffic. Next. Um, so it's three blocks long. We do still have the um, cross streets that have car access. And there are tons of planters for seating, um, benches everywhere. And next. Um, and we are a uh, business focused district, um, tons of retail, food and drink. Um, we do have some lodging on the mall and activities and services as well. So that's just a brief overview of how rethinking the right of way can be successful. Thanks, Callie. Um, I'm excited to hear more about your work in Cape May during the moderated uh, panel. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing uh, their projects and the work they've been doing. Now that we've gotten a bit of background on the right of way and seen some examples, 
I'd, I'd like to jump into our panel discussion. So to start off, it would be helpful to hear the steps you took to rethink the right of way. Dave, you touched on this in your presentation, but I'd love to hear from our other panelists. How did you ultimately get it done? And to start off, I'd like to throw it over to, Dave, uh, to Jay. Okay, thank you. So the, um, I think as I talked about a little before, the, the, the steps that were, were critical was really collaborating. Um, it's, it, this wasn't something that just, uh, I guess the borough, you know, alone could do. So what, what, how we went about it was working with borough officials, um, working with our downtown alliance, which is our special improvement district, um, working with um, some individual businesses and our and our police department because um you know there is when you talk about you know taking the right of way or closing a street there's lots of issues um uh, that, that come to light and, and and safety is one of them so our police were you know definitely concerned about that so um i think getting everyone together um to kind of come up with what the vision that the plan um would be um, was was really important. Uh, we also had engaged our borough planner um, in the process. And then once you had that plan, then it was communicating that to everybody because, um, you know, non some non-restaurant businesses on New Street weren't really happy about the street being closed. So um, you can have a great plan and a fantastic design in some cases, but if you haven't communicated that to everyone, so at least people are, you know, aware of what's what's going to be changing. Great, thanks, Jay. It's yeah, collaboration is definitely key. I'd like to pass it over to Spencer now, and uh, maybe you can talk a bit about your experience working with communities in the DBRPC region. Sure. So when we rolled out the initial findings uh, from the first effort in the spring of 2021, we were contacted by several municipalities in our region who were sort of, at that point, we were one year into the pandemic and they had, they implemented street closures like this, the types of um, uh, interventions that Jay was talking about uh, in the early days of the pandemic to sort of help the small businesses. And they wanted to then turn around and convince decision makers in their communities that it made sense to do that again, to keep doing that, that it was an effective uh, economic development tool. And so what we were able to do with the location analytics work is uh, actually benchmark um, the, the, the um, visits to and the trade areas of the downtowns before they implemented their um, uh, pandemic interventions, such as street closures and, and streeteries, and then compare that to visits during uh, the, the periods that they had those interventions rolled out. And what they were able to do then was go back to their decision makers and point to those numbers and say, look at what happened when we closed the streets. You can quantifiably see that um, the, the makeup and composition of the visitors changed. Um, people with, um, one of the things that came with the, the data that we purchased was um, people's spending habits and the amount of discretionary income that they had. And so they were able to say, during the street closures and the streeteries, when we rolled those uh, strategies out, we actually attracted people with more discretionary income to the downtown. Um, the visits to the downtown increased. And so they were able to use those quantifiable figures to argue for why it made sense to go ahead and implement those, those same changes and going forward as well. Wow, okay. It's great to hear that how data can be leveraged um, when thinking about the right of way and um, these topics. And I'd like to turn it to Callie now and um, hear your perspective as a business owner. And since you're the treasurer um, of, of in Cape May, um, I'd love to hear kind of the financial side of things. Um, yeah, take it away. So uh, as a business owner, having the Washington Street Mall exist has been um, a huge success for 50 years and it continues to be successful. Um, we didn't have any stores or biz or restaurants um, on the mall closed during COVID. Um, everyone, you know, everyone survived, everyone is still there. Um, so having the outdoor space, especially during COVID has been um, incredibly successful for us. Um, 
we also, so the Washington Street Mall Management Company, um, we are a public private partnership with the city of Cape May and um, the businesses are financially responsible for maintaining the Washington Street Mall. So it's in, you know, it's full circle. It's in the business's best interest to support this and keep everything, um, you know, the flowers beautiful, the lights on. Um, but definitely, um, I, I really, I mean, I wasn't alive in 1971, but I don't think that uh, Cape May would be the town that it is today without the creation of the Washington Street Mall. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about um, how space can be activated in the right of way. Um, first, from Jay and Matuchin. Sure. Um, that was one of our issues when we closed New Street uh, completely on weekends, um, you know, Friday afternoon till Sunday evening. Um, and it's, it was just a block long, but only having five restaurants set up in there. Um, it was busy Friday night and Saturday night, and then not very busy during the day. And um, it, so it was, I think the idea of programming is really critical to the success of, of um, a closure like that or, or re repurposing. And, um, because you know not everyone supports these these kind of efforts and when you have a an empty um block cl closed street with nothing going on it's like why are we doing this and all that we're only doing it for the restaurants so um you know and we again like i said we had music on um saturday evenings but it really there's a lot more to the creating a plan than i guess uh it it appears. I mean, we were so focused on helping the businesses and allowing them to use this space, uh, and then okay, so you know, how are we going to really activate it the whole the whole time? So then, when we switched to just closing the one side, um, and the restaurants were sort of you know condensed in that, it, you had less of an issue of trying to activate the rest of that space. So uh, that was a, a lesson learned for us. Thanks, Jay, and I'm sure. Uh, many other municipalities could probably um, take that a similar approach and have faced similar challenges. Um, Callie, uh, if you could speak a bit about your experience. Yes, definitely. So um, the mall is very well established. Um, obviously, it's been around for a while. Um, so in season, you know, Memorial Day through Labor Day, um, there's not a real need to create programming um, and different things to do there because everyone already knows, you know, they're coming to Cape May to go to the mall. Um, but in the off season, we do try and have events um, to get people, even the local community um, to come down to the mall. We have um, hospitality nights in the holiday shopping season. Um, we do sidewalk sales in the shoulder season. We have live music. Um, Cape May has a jazz festival. So we coordinate with them and have music on the mall. Um, and we also, um, we actually experimented with closing another one of the cross streets of the mall during COVID. Um, but that I think presented more challenges than benefits. Um, we had, a lot of, you know, the retail shops and because it was restaurant oriented, the retail shops thought, you know, you're just doing this for the restaurants and the residents of Decatur Street, which was closed, it did, it did create a bit of a traffic snarl. Um, so we're, we're experimenting with it as well. And it's, um, but there's, there are really are lots of things that you can do. And even, you know, without spending a lot of money on them um, to get people down there and realize that, you know, closing the street is worth it. Yeah, and it's great to hear that you all have really created a destination. Yeah. Um, we've already, st oh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna, I, I was just gonna add um, just a little perspective from the design side. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we always uh, encourage is flexibility in the design and planning of streets. So 
it is very difficult to predict what how people are going to use the street, whether it's a pedestrian or for programming. And also, it's, as we found with the pandemic, it's very difficult to predict what's coming down the road, right? So, um, no pun intended. But um, so we always like to design flexibility into the street so that as as things change and shift, there's that there's that that ability to kind of ebb and flow with with whatever the needs might be. So um, I think that's very important. You know, oftentimes we want to, you know, sort of place these fixed objects onto the street or whatever it might be. And um, that may end up obstructing something that you want to do down the line. So, so flexibility um, as it relates to programming, flexibility in the street design is is very important. I could piggyback off of that as well. It's it, as much as Dave was talking about flexibility. Our findings were that diversity is also important, and I think it's sort of the same um, of what Dave was talking about. And it gets to Jay and Callie's comments on the the restaurants and the retail businesses. If you have too much of one use or too much of one mode of transit, uh, it, it doesn't create vibrancy, vibrancy, it doesn't create energy. And what we found was that the more resilient downtowns were the ones that were more diverse, that they had a diverse mix of uses, whether it was office, retail, or residential. Um, and so I think it's, there's no silver bullet, there's no one approach. It takes sort of uh, attacking this thing at all angles and accommodating um, the greatest amount of diversity as possible. And to, if I can just uh, piggyback on what Spencer said, um, uh, and I found, you know, his presentation about you know, the data that was tracked and how the different downtowns performed, um, just wanted to talk about Metuchen, um, which we survived the pandemic, like, so well. I mean, I, I, I you know, I haven't vi visited all the other downtowns, but in New Jersey, but I think we we have come through through it stronger than the, than the vast majority, we we actually have more business openings um, through the pandemic. Very few businesses closed, and and I think to some degree what Spencer was saying is true. We we you know the the diversity of the of the community, the diversity of, we have much many more, uh, more diverse retail businesses than we did even three or four years ago. Yes, we have a lot of rest, a lot more restaurants, but it's not just a you know a dining thing. So um, you know I think. It was hearing that the data and the the tracking that was done it it helps and then then comparing it to our experience it's like wow it sort of validates what Spencer was talking about and it's a challenge to to build that diversity of businesses and retail in in the downtown but it, it's I think it does pay um, dividends when you're able to do that yeah and hopefully communities can take this advice about flexibility, diversity, and um, activate spaces in their communities. Um, I'd like to, we've touched a bit on challenges um, throughout your presentations and um, already in a couple of these questions, but what have been some challenges you've encountered when rethinking the right of way? And I'd like to turn it to Dave first. Oh, okay. Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, Challenges, yes, not, uh, you know, it, obviously changing the street and the way people use it is, comes with challenges. Um, I see some questions coming through on, on uh, jurisdiction, uh, you know, whether the, whether the street itself is owned by local municipality, county, state. Um, that is always a challenge, uh, dealing, obviously dealing with, with the county is, is, is a challenge and it's a negotiation, uh, dealing with the state is even more challenging. And so you have to, it's, it's about persistence and it's about data coming in with the right information. Um, but it's really, it, 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 it really has a lot to do with persistence, um, and, and, and being flexible in what you're doing, you know, and working with the state, working with the county and sort of not taking no for an answer. Um, a second challenge that, that I just want to touch on that I think is really important and I think comes from our perspective is uh, that streets are, you know, you don't want to underestimate the importance of street to people and what they mean to people, right? So streets are very personal, 
right? So when 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 we look at a street and we see a, a bench on a corner that that looks like a rundown, broken bench, um, there's someone in the municipality who you know, when they were 12 years old, had ice cream on that bench after their Little League game or something like that. People have these attachments. And so we learn that a lot because we come in and we, oh, we're going to replace this or something. And someone says, oh, I love that. And from the outside, you look at it and you, you love that? What, what is it? But, but to them, they have this connection to it. So and, and, and it's important. We can all think about that, you know, growing up, you know, streets are where you spent a lot of your time, you know, and, and, uh, so I think working with the public and being sympathetic and, and sort of understanding what these streets actually mean to people um, is, and, and, and working through the, the challenge of sort of shifting their perspective uh, on that is, you know, is also important. I could go on and on, but uh, on challenges, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, pa I'll pass it. Yeah, I really like your point on streets are personal because it's somebody's home and uh, we need to be compassionate. Right. Yeah. Uh, Callie, I'll pass it over to you. So some challenges that Cape May specifically has dealt with, um, parking is a huge one for us. Um, you know, we have tons of people. We've created this destination in the mall and there's nowhere for people to park. You know, even if they're coming in, uh, you know, with the car loaded and as many seatbelts buckled as can be, um, there's still nowhere for them to put, put their car when they get here. So that's definitely a huge challenge um, for Cape May in particular. Um, the resident access when we tried to close the Cater Street was, was also difficult. Um, and then the maintenance of the space. Um, in 2008, the mall was completely rebuilt. Um, all the, you know, from the storm drains on up and a lot of people outside of the mall said, you know, why is the city spending all of this money for these businesses? What are they going to do to, you know, make it worth it? So that's why we have this business improvement district that was created and the Washington Street Mall management company now manages the space. But then, you know, you even have the, the business owners that obviously benefit from their location and you know, just getting buy-in to put in the time and the effort to maintain this beautiful, great space that has been created. Um, as Dave said, there's a long list, um, but I think for us, those are those are the biggest ones. Thanks, Kelly. I'm, I'm glad you touched on maintenance and parking because I have a feeling a lot of communities probably face the same challenges. Um, and uh, the last question. Celeste. Oh, yeah. Go Sorry, ahead. I just wanted to... Um... It's my least favorite topic, but oh, I want to touch on parking. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Callie's example of the parking issue in Cape May is one that, you know, is so popular that there's no place for people to park. But when you're talking about repurposing a street, um, the parking issue there that, that, that we have dealt with is you're taking away my parking. Mm -hmm. Like, so if you, if you take away on-street parking, uh, you know, it's just, it, it makes you realize that we still have this real tension between this car centric culture that most of New Jersey is, um, is still has this grip on us. Um, this tension between that and the idea that's, that Dave talks about like, that streets are for everyone. And, and so that that's this pedestrian, um, you know, tension between the car centric culture and the pedestrian uh culture is, is it just comes to light and um and parking is always a big thing discussion in Metuchen. um we actually have plenty of parking but we, unfortunately we have residents and businesses that think if someone can't park exactly directly in front of my business that uh you know uh, you know they're going to lose the customer they're not so it's it's really uh it's a real challenge and and don't underestimate um, if you're thinking of repurposing right of way and, and a street, you gotta you gotta address the parking um, perception right up front. And and I think some of the information that Spencer has, there is data to show that when you convert a a, a street or a parking lot to a, a a better use, that it it's a, it's better for businesses, it's better for the town, 
um, it's better for economic development, but you can't just make that assumption. You've got to um, understand, and people are emotional to parking and not just the bench that Dave talked about. It's, it's a really strange dynamic that you'll encounter, at least in, in Metuchen, and I don't think we're unlike others. So um, there's a question of enough, uh, adequate parking is one thing, but taking away parking, converting parking is another, is a different animal. Thanks, Jay. I'm glad you you added a bit more on parking because it is a challenge. Um, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for our last question, how can evidence be used to overcome challenges? And I'll pass it over to Spencer to start us off. I think that um, using data and the types of analyses that I highlighted today, to be able to point to that uh, empirical evidence can support an argument. Um, I, I think that in the types of um, conversations that Jay was having, he was able to point and say that we have enough parking. You know, so if, you, if, if you're hearing from the community or you're from the, re, the, the business community that parking is a concern, to be able to point to the, you know, a study showing that in fact, parking isn't a concern. There is enough parking in town. Um, we can actually afford to lose some spaces to implement the changes that we're talking about and not run the risk of running out of enough parking. So uh, doing those types of analytical studies and coming into discussions with uh, quantifiable data, it, it helps support the more qualitative uh, um, uh, goals and plans uh, that the communities want to implement or, or would like to implement. Thanks, Spencer. And Dave, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's it's really about, you know, it's really about going back and visiting the places that, you know, some of this is intangible, right? And um, I think a lot of it is going back and visiting the places that have done this, speaking to the businesses that are there. Um, a lot of this is, it can, can be, you know, hard data. And a lot of it, I think, can be a, a little bit more uh, subjective, a little bit more experiential. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's really about um, showing where it has been done. You know, for us, oftentimes I know there's some questions in in, in the chat here about um, how do you overcome sort of uh, you know traffic engineers that are reluctant or mm -hmm. or fire chiefs that are reluctant uh, to reduce uh, travel widths, etc. And um, for us, the most successful way of doing that is showing them places where it has been done. And we can do that now, you know, which is great. Right. 10 years ago, you know, when complete streets and, and, and this, this kind of movement was, was really just taking, taking shape, there wasn't many precedent, much precedent, especially in New Jersey, um, where now there are plenty of projects where we can point to, like Metuchen, et cetera, where we can say, look, it's been done here and it has been successful. And you know, and, and we, we can speak to them about the, the, the challenges and, 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 and things, but, but, you know, it's, 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 it's feasible. Um, so, yeah, uh, that, that's, you know, that, that's my opinion there. Yeah. Um, in could, the case, oh, go ahead. Yeah, if I could real quickly just say, build off of that, that, um, you know, what works in Metuchen and what works in Cape May may not be able to be rubber stamped in your community. Every community is unique and right. you should approach these conversations um, in a way that is, is true to your community. And instead of trying to rubber stamp every um, uh, example, take the, the intent and the, the desire, the outcome from that uh, approach and, and apply the, that to your community and tailor it as necessary. Thanks, Spencer. Sure. That was a great way to end our moderated um, session. I'd like to, we could probably talk about this all day, but I do want to give some time for audience questions. Um, we have quite a few in the chat. So Courtney, I'll hand it off to you. Hi, I'm going to join our box. Now we have six instead of five uh, Brady Bunch boxes. Um, so uh, one, I just, I, I can't, because I can't not add commentary about parking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you think about the towns you want to visit, the best downtowns, all of them are screaming that they have a parking problem. A parking problem means you're successful right, and you're doing something right. So don't worry about your parking problem because people are still coming to your downtown and they're parking and they're walking. So that's that's part of what I want to say. Uh, but then, agree. yeah. 
Um, but then there was a question, I, I, uh, one, of, one of the late coming questions about, um, you know, a lot of this is, is, is attracting some people from UMS outside and attracting people with disposable income. How do you keep your downtown economically diverse and that you, particularly if you have an economically diverse downtown and really attract all residents uh, to your downtown when you're, are you thinking about that as you're doing these things? Um, I, I imagine Dave, uh, we know Passaic's very diverse. That was, I'm sure, part of the discussion there, same in Montclair. So maybe we kick it to Dave first and that, then let everybody else chime in. Yes, I, I you know, I, I it's, it, it's always a, um, an important subject and um, right in, 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 in Passaic, you know, really, the, the, the driver there was, you know, Passaic, Main Avenue and Passaic has a very vibrant uh, sort of local retail uh, service retail um, environment. And, and, and everything that we had done there was, was through that lens, you know, from, from the city side. Um, you know, it's a challenge. You know, I think Montclair has done a great job um, because I think it is, you know, go, going back to, you um, to what Spencer was saying, it, it, it is about diversity. And so, 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 you know, if if we don't have the sort of smaller shops the, the, that that are supporting the local community, then um, you know people will just go to a mall. Um, so I think that that's that it's 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 um, um, you know I I think that it's it's um, something that's you know that's consistently discussed and and. Um, as Spencer said, the places that are successful in doing that are the ones that 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 end up thriving. Great. Actually, Spencer, do you want to add some from from what you've seen? Well, I actually wanted to sort of build off something that Callie said. She hi highlighted the business improvement district in Cape May, and I think that that's uh, an important and valuable tool for communities to have because uh, bids are able to um, sort of be a little bit more involved in the, 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 the retail mix, the business mix in the downtown and help curate uh, sort of that diversity in the mix of uses um, that's needed. If you had, one of the things that I found in my analysis was that downtowns that had too much neighborhood goods and services businesses, so like hair salons and those types of establishments, they were actually really um, hit hard during the pandemic. And so what, what, I, what the takeaway for me was there was it wasn't that neighborhood goods and service businesses are bad for a downtown. It's that if you have too much of any one type of establishment in a downtown, that's where you start to lose that vibrancy and diversity. And so um, I, I think business improvement, district, improvement districts are a, a great tool for downtowns to use to help manage and curate that mix of uses. Great. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, totally agree. We are, uh, our our downtown, our businesses would not have survived as well as they did through uh, COVID if we didn't have our um, business improvement or special improvement district. That term is inter interchangeable in my mind. Um, it, ours is only about five or six years old, and uh, I I can't imagine what would have happened in our town if if we didn't have them. And you know, to that idea about diversity and a, and and serving a, the greater community, I think you know we're in M Middlesex County, which is um, either the, the the most or the second most diverse county in this in the in the state, and we're a little town, so we know that our businesses can't survive with just serving the fifteen thousand people live in Metuchen. So we look to attract people from the county and, and beyond. And our special our Metuchen Downtown Alliance. Um, one of the things that they do, besides trying to recruit um, diverse businesses, is the events that they put on. So just as an example of the diversity of events, um, we they've done a, and I'm I'm part of the Downtown Alliance myself. I'm on the board, so when I say we, um, a Lunar New Year celebration, we're having a Juneteenth um, celebration, and a breakdancing event. Just as three events that are going to be on our public plaza. So um, the uh, business improvement or special improvement district can do a lot to help. Um, tap into the diversity and, and the resources in, in your area. Great, thank you. Callie, you have anything to add on this one? Um, not really. Okay. No problem. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Um, yeah, we've talked about this a lot at downtown New Jersey. So I do recommend, I think we had a whole session on, on equity and uh, at 
the actually the keynote in a session um, at our last conference. Um, so do check that out. Uh, lots of great ideas with placemaking, uh, recruitment, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna, Jack, Jack Molnar wants to bring it back to parking again. Uh, <laughs> Have, have any of your communities decided to implement dynamic pricing for parking, um, at least increase the price of parking in high demand? Is, has, has anyone, you know, worked on alternative parking strategies? Callie, go ahead. So I do have stuff to add about parking. Um, so in Cape May, around the mall area, we have, um, I think it's four blocks wide by it's like a four block square where we have um, parking is increased to two dollars an hour and everywhere else in the city it is one dollar an hour um, so in the very local to the mall area uh, we it's not dynamic but we, it is more expensive than elsewhere in the city and i did see um, another one of the questions was uh is there not enough parking or too much free parking? Um, the free parking in Cape May is not necessarily close enough to where people want to be. So the free parking that's close to the mall is typically full by like eight or nine o'clock in the morning by all of the employees of the businesses. Um, so then you really have to consider, you know, how far is someone really gonna walk to do what they wanna do? Um, the, a lot of the visitors of Cape May, um, you know, it's very family friendly and we have multi-generation families that are coming to visit. So you might have, you know, a three-year-old that can't walk very far with their 85-year-old grandmother that also can't walk very far. So um, definitely things to consider for parking. Anyone else, else wanna to add to parking? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I, you know, I guess we could just add to parking. This is like the, uh, the topic here. Right. But, but um, it all, it always is. Every conversation starts with parking, unfortunately, but um, I, I was just going to, to piggyback on what Callie said there. And because it's a lot of the communities that we work in, that is that right. People want to park right in front of the place that they're going to. And, and so one point I just want to make about that is that sometimes it has to do with the experience of walking from where the parking is to where they're going. Right. So if, 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 you know, parking that's a block away could seem like a mile away. If that, if that walk from the parking lot to the main street is, 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 is not, not an enjoyable walk or the sidewalks are uneven or the, we had a, we had um, a, a meeting just this week with a community and a woman said that uh, her grandmother can't come there anymore because she has to park a block away and there are no benches. So she can't, there's nowhere for her to stop and rest. So she stopped coming for that reason. So, I think that it, it's 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 this it's this shift. So if if we eliminate parking and we we we're pushing people to other areas to park, we have to make sure that that connection from that parking to the downtown is is enjoyable and and proper and and frankly encourages economic vitality, right? I mean, if the more the people are walking and they're stopping and looking at stores, the more that they're that they're you know seeing what's in town and hopefully the more money they're going to spend. So. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that about just about that sort of creating that that connection. That's a huge point. Yeah. Yeah, if I could just build off that too. I, I if if I went downtown to go to the bookstore, right, but I couldn't park right in front of the bookstore. I had to park a block away. And on my way to the bookstore, I passed somebody eating an ice cream from the local ice cream shop. All of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? I really could go for an ice cream too. And so I'm going to stop in the ice cream store. Whereas if I didn't have to make that walk and I didn't have to see that person eating their ice cream, I wouldn't have spent my other my other dollar downtown on ice cream in, in addition mm -hmm. to the book that I went down there to buy. Hey, Courtney, there's um, I'm just looking through the uh, question. There was uh, one from uh, Molly about do you worry about pri privatization of the public? Yeah, I was, was going to get to that one. Yeah, Can sorry. I add one more just, thing on parking before okay, we go yeah, to go that ahead, one? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, the other thing I, I, guess I saw, you also have to think about loading and deliveries and things like that, especially if you're restaurant heavy. Um, and and I think I know Matouch, a lot of towns did it during the, the pandemic. They added, you know, 15 minute curb parking so that oh, yeah. you could go in pick up some communities do this permanently i was up in quebec and first of all they had most of the parking was taken up by streeteries and then what was left was 15 minute you know loading unloading go get your your thing and mm -hmm. the key to that if you're going to do that 
is you actually have to enforce it. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was sitting watching delivery folks double parked in Jersey City while I was eating in a streetery the other day and everybody trying to get around. I'm like, well, if we had these type of short term loading zones, because it was a delivery guy, he was going to pick up something to go take, which would also be great if all the delivery guys were on bikes and scooters as opposed to in cars. Uh, but that's another thing. So I just want to, you know, that's another thought to think about in your community if you do have you know, mm -hmm. that type of need, you have to think about this loading and delivery is up. So yeah, let's Jay, let's go to your, your, okay. so do you want me, to, I'll read the question uh, yeah. so that everybody knows. Uh, do you worry about privatization of the public realm with enclosed dining on the sidewalk? Outdoor dining measurably contributes positively to the public experience, but when it's enclosed, how is it different from private property? So it's, you know, yes, it's a, it's a, you know, concern. I think the, um, the idea, I think, that what I have is, can that can that sidewalk be shared? Uh, so and I, so clearly you need enough um, width or depth of your sidewalk. And I think I mentioned earlier there are parts in our downtown where you can't. There's some places you can't even put a table and chair on the sidewalk. Never mind enclosing it. So um, and the examples that I showed were one where we could accommodate. But both. I mean, there, the there was enough. There was passageway um, so that pedestrians. You know, it's still. It's to me. It's a shared. It's you know a shared area or shared shared asset. So um, I do not support you know taking over the sidewalk and 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 in effect making it uh, making it private. I guess the image of the enclosed sidewalk dining may. I mean, maybe it conveys this privacy thing, but. Um, you know, it's really, as I said, I think earlier, it's the exact same footprint of what that restaurant had before there was any awning or enclosure or whatever. It was, you know, um, table with, with two chairs. So uh, I think, as I said earlier, I think the world has changed. I think outdoor dining is here to stay. And I think our challenge is to find where it is appropriate, where it can work, where we can use these as shared spaces and not advocating private privatization of of a uh, public spaces, I think the, I think the uh, we're talking about the opposite thing, uh, activating public spaces, and and using that to as you know to make our downtowns better. So Dave, can you add to that one from a design perspective a little bit too about and it, it, obviously all your your widening sidewalks. I always look at the utilities too. How many how many signs, utility poles, street lamps, blah blah blah. That yeah. if you come out are now in the way of somebody who could potentially have an accessibility issue. So yeah, I mean this is that's why you know in the beginning of the presentation there I emphasized the three steps right and because planning right it's planning is is frankly, is the, is the fun part, you know, it, it, thinking of these ideas. And then when you get into design, you know, and that, that you're really getting into that nitty gritty and streets have to serve all of these purposes. And um, yes, there are tons of conflicts and things that you run into and, 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 and all of these challenges along the way um, that need to be worked through. And frankly, some of them don't come out until you're in construction you know, and, and you're in that final phase and, and, and someone comes out and says, oh, wait, that this restaurant, they used to put their outdoor dining here. And we have three benches and a trash receptacle that are going there. And you speak to that property owner and, and you have to be able to move and adjust on, on the fly. Um, you know, I definitely have opinions about privatization of public space. You know, I, I think that the sidewalk, we have to be very careful about that. I think that, um, you know, through the pandemic, it was it was sort of like a, a sink or swim type of situation, and and so so at the rule book went out the went out the window, and and we sort of just wanted to help everyone survive through this, right? But now I think that we have to circle back, and if this is becoming more permanent, we have to think through what 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 the what what that means, and uh, and how that 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 works, you know, through ordinances and things to ensure that that. Um, you know that there's plenty of space for 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 people um and uh, so i, th I think it, i think it's an important topic but um yeah thanks jay or, or dave so jay has to drop off so i want to say a big thank you to jay um oh. but i did want to jump so thank you jay i okay, do want to jump you. back to callie on this question and then we can end so thank you jay okay. very much because uh, callie obviously that's a private yeah well there's you're, you're a private 
entity. So I think you, you have something to add here on this question and then we can wrap up. Yes. So, I mean, um, I think COVID provided a case study for all communities about, um, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And these ideas of, you know, closing streets or putting tables on sidewalks and uh, redirecting traffic, you know, it was like, okay, we did this, we tried it, it worked, but we're not going to make it permanent because we need to tweak it to be able to do these things. Um, so um, on the mall in particular, um, there are, count one, two, there's like 10 restaurants that um, already have permanent structures um, or semi-permanent structures outside. And they have a, um, so there's basically flagstone lines uh, down the middle of the mall. And um, the, the restaurants are permitted to create outdoor seating up to that line, but they can't go past. Um, so it, there is a permanent pedestrian right of way on the mall. Um, and so these businesses have the opportunity to do it if they want to, um, but because it's already closed to car traffic on the mall, it's not really, um, there's, there's enough space for everyone is what I'm trying to say. Um, but um, yeah, it's definitely something that has to be considered because you, I, on Beach Avenue, for example, they completely closed the sidewalk, they took away parking and it was kind of, as a, uh, as a resident of the area, it became very difficult to travel through that area of town. Um, and I think that it, I'm, I hate to say it, but I'm glad it's not there anymore because it, it really did make things challenging. Um, but yeah, outdoor dining is definitely here to stay. And um, I think there are ways to really make it work, definitely. Great, thank you. So mm -hmm. Celeste, do you want to um, close us out? Yeah, well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today, especially our panelists. It's been great to hear your experiences, background and case studies, um, rethinking the right of way. Uh, and I want to thank downtown New Jersey and, uh, and Rutgers VTC for working with Transit Friendly Planning on this, on this event. Um, and stay tuned for more events in the future.